Welcome to today's webinar, Lessons Learned During the COVID-19 Pandemic and Moving to Online Learning. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our presenters today, Susan Sinkowitz and Mary Kitzmiller. Both are faculty at the Community College of Rhode Island. Susan Sinkowitz has been a clinical nurse for most of her impressive 39-year nursing career and has experience in medical surgical, pediatric, and obstetric nursing. She holds a nursing license in all four states on the Northeastern Seaboard, with most of her career having been spent in the state of Rhode Island. This fall, Susan starts her 32nd year at the Community College of Rhode Island, where she has served as department chair since 2016. Additionally, Susan is also the author of the Clinical Nursing Calculations text too. Mary Kitzmiller has 30 years of clinical nursing experience, most of which has been spent in level one trauma centers. And she says that nursing is still one of the best decisions she's ever made. For the last 10 years, she's been in nursing education and she's also a proud military spouse. And this opportunity has afforded her the privilege of working in a variety of settings and locations around the country. Susan and Mary do not claim to be experts in the field of online learning. Today, they simply have been asked to join us to share their experience and their recommendations. So I just wanted to note that before we get started. So at this time, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Susan and Mary, please go ahead. Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm gonna to talk about our spring. Our usual spring semester probably mirrors a lot of other nursing programs out there. We have in-class lectures two days a week in three to four hour blocks of time. We have our required office hours. We take students into a variety of clinical settings and those clinical days range from six to 12 hours. Depending on the semester they're in, our students may have a mandatory skills lab. And we also offer open lab opportunities for students in any semester to practice their skills. We're very proud of our state-of-the-art simulation lab and it's usually booked solid. So that's our usual semester. But then the unusual happened, a little thing called COVID-19. And everything I just mentioned essentially became null and void. We had no idea what the future held, but we did know that we had to act fast. It seemed as though we had a two week window to move our entire program online. We began with the seemingly easy fix. We started converting our PowerPoints to recorded lectures. This was probably a little easier said than done. It's one thing to be in class in the middle of lecture and make a slight glitch and carry on unnoticed. However, recording lectures are immortalized. And for many of us, self-included, Producing a smooth, clean, post-worthy presentation took considerable practice, angst, and time. We also discovered that recording directly into PowerPoint took up way too much memory on our learning management system, Blackboard. So we had to find a workaround in order to get all of our lectures posted. We had to employ a previously little used feature on Blackboard, and that was the discussion board function. We initially used this for a dual purpose, taking attendance and allowing for questions or clarifications of lecture material. However, we ended up refining our use of this function as the semester continued. Next, we had to wrap our heads around the concept of teaching clinical nursing all online, which at face-to-face -face value seemed like an almost impossible task to execute, at least in an effective and meaningful way. Equally challenging was now conducting everything in a virtual format. If it used to be face-to-face, -face, it was now online. Add to that, the campus was closed. Although we did have a short window of time to retrieve needed items, invariably one or two things that would have made life a whole lot easier got left behind. There was also a sense of urgency behind all of our actions, driven by the constraints of our academic calendar, but also the pandemic itself. Things were changing so rapidly, the unknown so great, that we simply had to take a deep, deep breath and continue onward. It was a little bit like building an airplane in mid-flight. We had to tackle both didactic and clinical teaching. We figured out the lecturing component well enough, but clinical, online, clinic is so hands-on, so kinesthetic. 
observations and demonstrations and verifications. How could that be taught online? Let the record show I was vehemently opposed and didn't think it could be done, but we did it. We shifted our focus from the actual doing aspect to a more critical thinking approach. Our entire faculty scoured the internet to vet websites that would be applicable for our learning objectives. We primarily focused on unfolding case studies and virtual simulations. We took advantage of the generous free trials and reduced rates of many virtual clinical software that was out there. We did have to be mindful, however, of when the trial offers expired so as not to incur additional costs for our students. Our IT department was indispensable at this time, offering courses and webinars to get us all up to speed. It really did take a village. Next slide, please. So now we're doing it. We're teaching online, clinic included. The airplane we constructed with glue and rubber bands was actually holding together. Not without a little turbulence, however, peer feedback revealed that our faculty was overwhelmed with technology and in the same vein, fatigued from it. Several faculty were more familiar with our LMS and technology in general, and many were not self-included. So there was a little bit of a learning curve. And now that we were managing both lecture and clinical online, there was an inordinate amount of time spent at the computer. Which brings me to the other common theme that developed, Zoom fatigue. Having to be on without the energy and feedback that's usual in a live setting was exhausting. There were some positives, however. Faculty enjoyed the decreased commute time, the flexibility of hours, and an unexpected bonus besides yoga pants was the efficiency of meetings, as when meetings, we found out, are conducted virtually, it eliminates a lot of unnecessary dialogue. Student feedback primarily fell into these three categories, clinical concerns, school home balance, and missed social interaction. Students worried about the lack of hands-on experience and appearing stupid in the clinical setting once we were allowed back in. Students didn't want to give the impression that they were unprepared or not ready to be a nurse. They worried about being labeled a COVID cohort and therefore having difficulty securing a job in the future. Students also found themselves trying to balance their own schooling with the added challenge of homeschooling their children. Time management and computer access became issues for them to deal with. And of course, the missed social interaction, not only with their peers, but particularly the ability to ask questions in real time during our lectures. A positive with the students was that they were very appreciative for the ability to listen to the recorded lectures on their own time and more than once. But more importantly, students were grateful for the opportunity to continue their education and not delay degree progression. So we took all of this feedback from our students and simply acknowledged the elephant in the living room. We admitted this was not an ideal situation for them to be in as future nurses, but reminded them that the entire nation of future nurses was essentially in the same boat. We validated that it was a scary, unprecedented, unprecedented time in history, but we were all in this together. We had to reassure them as well. Although we were faculty, we didn't necessarily know what was gonna happen in the future because this pandemic made things impossible to predict. But we did let them know that while our methods had changed, our goal was the same, to graduate competent, safe, prepared nurses. We assured students that all of their assignments were designed to be meaningful, value-added, not busy work, but to promote critical thinking. And that said, while we hold our students to an exceptionally high standard, there was leniency given on deadlines and in virtual interactions, children in the background or even in, on a lap, the occasional pet, that all became a part of the allowable norm. Students had mentioned their concerns about their potential exposure to COVID if and when we did return to the clinic. 
While not overly worried about their own health, many of our students either have young children or take care of their elderly parents or both. And they were more worried about uh, exposing a loved one. We reiterated that their personal safety remained a priority just as it, as it had always been even prior to COVID. Reaching out and keeping the lines of communication open for students was paramount to decrease their anxiety. I dedicated the first 10 minutes of every virtual action with students to letting them decompress, vent, and to clarify the latest rumor going around. Having students jump on Collaborate allowed for more personal interaction than a text, but maintained professional boundaries. This method made a nice compromise since there were no longer face-to-face -face interactions. Quick responses to student emails was another way to decrease student anxiety. We were thrust into this situation of emergency remote teaching without any roadmap or compass. We realized we had to address the emotional components of a pandemic in tandem, in tandem with teaching nursing students. Throughout this process, we found that some things worked really well and some things did not work at all. Here to go into more detail about our discoveries is my friend and colleague, Susan Sankowitz. Thank you, Mary. Um, so let's talk about what we discovered worked regarding classroom teaching. Um, I'll address the asynchronous strategies first. Pre-recording lectures address the work-school-family balance concerns of students. Uh, learning to record lectures was a challenge for some of our faculty. We have several options available to us at CCRI. We have Media Lecture, which is like Camtasia or Lecture Capture. We have Blackboard Collaborate, which is a feature within our learning management system for recording lectures. And of course, Voice over PowerPoint, and that's probably the easiest. But the problem with that was it, it takes up the most space. And space is certainly an issue when posting recordings in Blackboard. So our workaround for recording in PowerPoint was to export the file to an MP4 file. And if you're not sure how to do that, the, the easiest way to do it is to, when you're, um, you go to the file menu, you select export, select change file type, save as, and then when you get the save as type drop down menu, you just select MP4, uh, MPEG4 video. Um, if you want that click path sent to you, um, just send a quick message to Jen via the chat feature and we can send that click path to you. It's really just a couple of steps to save a, a, a recorded PowerPoint as an MPEG4 file. But um, it takes time for that to happen. It, I mean, the steps don't take time, but the saving process takes time. But it's worth it. It's definitely worth the time. Um, and the advantage to recording um, in PowerPoint is the ability to edit each slide. Media Lecture, Lecture Capture, Blackboard Collaborate, they, they only allow for editing at the beginning and ending of presentations. At least that's the case for the versions that we work with at the Community College of Rhode Island. Um, students gave a lot of positive feedback about the pre-recorded lectures. They liked not only that they could listen on their own time, but that they could play back difficult topics and re-listen to presentations or parts of presentations. Um, in terms of uh, synchronous classroom teaching, we found that Q&A sessions were great for connecting with students. Kahoot works really well for interactive Q&A sessions, and I'll talk a little bit more about that app in a few moments. As you know, interactive sessions is important for getting the students engaged, and it provides that opportunity to clarify difficult content. Um, synchronous Q&A sessions worked best with smaller groups like clinical groups, but you can make it work with big groups if you put the students in teams, and that also fosters a sense of camaraderie. Um, for the upcoming semester, we're planning to continue with remote instruction, and so we're gonna continue providing those pre-recorded lectures, and then we're gonna use our scheduled classroom time for interactive activities. So not only Q&A sessions, but unfolding case studies like Mary mentioned. And many of those, by the way, are publisher provided resources. So I'm gonna say a little bit more about Kahoot on the next slide. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with it, but um, if, you're, if you're not, I strongly encourage you to create an account. This is the website you get here by just going to kahoot.com. They can just join by going to their browser and typing in www.kahoot.it. So if I'm going to join, so now you can see that my name is on the screen. 
up, see, I've got a few people already joining me. Say, I got BK and I got NY Medic Institute. All right, so now I'll start the game. And we have three, two, one, and blast off. So following delivery, which newborn assessment data is abnormal and requires further evaluation. And um, you can set your time to answer questions, 20 seconds, 60 seconds, whatever you want. And um, say three, two, one, blast off. So it's going to go to the, so it automatically goes to the next question. Wow, we've got more people joining us. So now we have six people. So, okay, so the normal, and so I would take the time to explain what the normal axillary temperature is on a newborn, which is 36.5 to 37.5. And so then we go to the next question and, uh, and so on. And um, this is an easy one. <laughs> There we go, Fontanelles, yes, you got it. And you can see how it's giving you an ongoing score. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna close out of Kahoot, but you get the idea. All right, so at the end, what happens is um, you, and by the way, once you, once you develop one, if you wanna see what it looks like, you can see, you can, um, see your questions this way and show your answers. And so you have, there's the rest of my questions for that particular quiz. So what you'll see when you get to the end of Kahoot, which is really fun, is a podium. And so they show the third place winner, the bronze winner, then the second place winner. There's a lot of drama and music with it and confetti, and it's kind of fun. And the students really love competing for first, second, and third place, and they like seeing their names on the podium. Um, so even students that don't win a medal like this kind of engagement. And the other really nice thing about Kahoot is it allows you to save your results in an Excel spreadsheet. So from my dosage calculations course, you might have seen a lot of my dosage calculations um, quizzes in there. Um, I use this information to provide weekly bonus points to their weekly quizzes. Um, and students, I find, are incentivized to master the weekly material as they strive to obtain those Kahoot points, as we call them. All right, now we'll move on to discovering um, what worked with regards to clinical teaching. So um, with our Mass Rhode Island League of Nursing shared with us several resources, some of which are on this slide. Um, we've, the, the Virtual Healthcare Experience is a Canadian resource created by Centennial College, Ryerson University, and George Brown College. And so when you, if you want to click in there, Jen, you can, but it doesn't matter. So if you click on this link, it brings you to that site um, and you click play game or enter, uh, you uh, click enter first and you select a specialty. You can see all the different specialties. And then you click, click play, game, play game. And from there, you get to meet your patient. And you're asked a series of questions. You're asked how to handle your patient or how to answer your patient. Um, and it walks you through a simulated experience. It's really nice. Um, the second link, if you go back to that first slide, Jen, because you can see kind of what's happening here. Yeah, the second link um, brings you to NLN's unfolding case studies. From there, you link out to a site. If you scroll down, Jen, it'll show you unfolding case studies above the, yes. And it shows you exactly how to use the, the unfolding case studies. It gives you the, um, there's a link for all the documents associated with each, with each case study. And um, you, you select the, the case study that you want and you download the files that are associated with it. The third, there's the four uh, unfolding case studies there, and then you can see if you scroll down, you can see the you you download um, up, uh, up a little bit further. It'll show you where the download is. Oh, there we go. Oh, yep, download the files, and there's a bunch of files associated with each unfolding case study. So that's and that's a, again a free resource from the National League for Nursing. The other link that's on that page on that slide is the Swift River Virtual Hospital. That's a site developed for nurses, by nurses for nurses. It's designed to be clinical training for students and practicing nurses. It's very similar to the first one we looked at. Yeah, we can go, um, we can keep going, Jen, that's fine. Yep, but you see all the specialties and so on. But you'll have that, you'll have these links um, that you can cut and paste, type and paste into your browser copy and paste into your browser if you want to access them on your own. So another idea that worked well for Skills Lab was sending skills 
kits to students at home. For each skills lab, we selected a couple of skills that students would be required to demonstrate. Skill supplies were packaged and sent to students through the United States Post Office. Some supplies included catheterization kits, ostomy supply care supplies, wound care supplies, syringes, no needles, um, and also Play-Doh. Play-Doh was used to, for students to create their own ostomy for pouching, um, to create a wound for, to demonstrate a damp to dry dressing change, to create a, my, a muscle for an IM injection, and so on. Um, faculty required their skill student skill demonstration would review major teaching points um, remotely, of course, that students were required to view videos and, and, and um, skill checklists and in preparation for skill demonstration. And then they had to record their demonstrations on their iPads. All of our students have iPads for testing and other purposes. Um, and then they would uh, submit their recorded presentation to the instructor. Now, none were perfect. Most of them reflected a lot of preparation, practice, and creativity. Um, it was a labor-intensive process for faculty to review each video um, and then, in turn, provide point-by-point -point feedback. But juice was definitely worth the squeeze. The students provided a lot of positive feedback regarding this learning experience. Another labor-intensive part of the process was to send the kits home. Um, assembling these kits was a major feat to be sure. It required our sim tech Michelle on the left and our lab tech Lauren on the right, many hours of assembly. Um, as previously mentioned, this kit, that they were, the kits were um, packaged and sent through the post office. Uh, the cost to mail all of these kits was about $2,000. The cost per kit for the enclosed items was offset by the fact that these items would have been consumed and used by students if we were on site. Um, on a go-forward basis, we're planning to use skill kits again for the fall so that students can practice and prepare for skill demonstration at home. So skill kits are being assembled for the fall semester right now because our lab time is going to be split in half as we'll be working with only four students at a time in the lab instead of eight. So in order, and that's in order to comply with social distancing requirements. So with um, limited lab time, students again in the fall 2020 semester are going to be required to uh, submit videotape demonstrations of select skills. And, and an unexpected positive finding of teaching remotely, both clinical and classroom, was that we learned that we have the ability to do it. And, and do it effectively. And we now know that there will no need, there will be no need to make up clinical time for snow days. Um, next, I'm going to mention what didn't work. Because we were putting together virtual clinical assignments with minimal prep time, we used all the free resources we could find. This required students to visit mul multiple sites, establish personal and separate accounts for each site and each product. Most free trials had a short window of opportunity for use, but we were able to work within the limited time frame. To address this issue, our faculty vetted multiple virtual clinical products this summer. So on a go-forward basis, we put these clinical products that we've selected on our syllabi as recommended resources with the disclaimer that in the event that we revert to virtual clinical, this product will become a required resource. So it's on our syllabi for the fall as recommended resources, but it will become required if we revert to uh, online clinical again, remote clinical. Um, this allows the students to purchase these products with their financial aid dollars at the beginning of the semester, because they only have until week two, I think, to use their financial aid dollars, then they have to give it back. Um, for obvious reasons, in the spring, we couldn't update our syllabi mid-semester and suddenly require students to buy new products, but we have that luxury, luxury if you want to call it that, for the fall. Um, as Mary mentioned, as a means of taking attendance, we decided that we would use the online discussion board within Blackboard. Um, so students were required to post a comment or question for each recorded lecture and would in turn be given attendance credit for that lecture. This turned out to be challenging to monitor. Students were posting similar or repeat questions just for the sake of getting attendance credit. To work around this issue, we decided that we would allow the students, if they had no question or comment or had nothing different to say other than what was already posted, that they could just post the word present 
and we would give them attendance credit for that. Um, we found that synchronous Q&A sessions to be a much more meaningful way to vet student questions. Um, virtual meetings presented technology glitches. I'm sure many of you experienced them. To prepare for remote proctoring, we administered a mock test to faculty. So this is another thing that didn't work was remote proctoring. Um, so we it administered a mock test to faculty while other faculty proctored via Zoom. Our mock test takers were able to do naughty things like take photos of computer screens, scan textbooks for answers without any of our proctors, proctors noticing this behavior. So rather than proctor remotely via Zoom, we decided that we would do a couple of things. We would monitor student IP addresses to be sure no one was testing from the same location. We disabled backward navigation so students could not leave questions unanswered and go back to them. And we limit the testing time to 1.5 minutes per question. Um, we have the capability to check IP addresses and apply these settings through ExamSoft, which is our testing software. In addition to these measures, we established an honor code to which students had to agree to adhere. To simplify the process, students signed off on this honor code, which is on the next slide, via Google Doc. So you can see the honor code here. I'll, te I'll take all tests independently without any help. I won't use any references. I won't have any references in my proximity. I won't use any electronic devices other than the one I'm using. I won't print tests or take screenshots. I won't share information. And I understand a violation might result in a grade of zero. Now, we have no illusions that this honor code prevents anyone or everyone from cheating. But we do believe it's a deterrent for honorable individuals. Um, now we'd like to share a few recommendations. Our first step in moving to virtual clinical was to seek input from the board, our Board of Nursing and ASIN, our accrediting agency. We wanted to be sure that whatever we chose to do with regards to clinical teaching would meet with their approval. Although both agencies were non-prescriptive, the Rhode Island Board of Nursing is requiring us to put in writing the virtual clinical assignments for each course and how each assignment matches up to our stated clinical hours and objectives. Our, clinical, our course coordinators have kept track of this data, which we have yet to submit to our board. Our publishers reached out immediately to offer support, for which we were most grateful. So we would certainly recommend reaching out to your publishers for ideas and support. During this crisis, we learned a lot about the functionality of our learning management system, Blackboard. Many of our faculty were unaware that we had a virtual classroom called Collaborate right within Blackboard. Our IT department stepped up in a big way during this crisis. They are probably our unsung heroes. They were available almost 24 seven for our extended spring break during which time we, that's the time we had to prepare for virtual teaching. Um, we also discovered that it would be important to be aware of your institutional policies and what products are supported by IT. For example, um, many faculty use Zoom for clinical conferences, but our IT department doesn't support it. So we had to learn to use WebEx for meetings and conferences. Some of us, like myself, are still learning the functionality of WebEx. I just discovered I can make, I can phone people through WebEx. Who knew? Um, now for some tools and resources. As I mentioned uh, previously, um, next slide, please. Kahoot is a great tool to have in your toolbox. This advice is coming from someone who has used clickers for years. My colleagues dubbed me the clicker queen as I have tried over many years to engage them in the use of iClickers and turning technology clickers and eClickers. There was three different types of clickers I've used in the past. Um, as regards clickers, there's a cost to students and a bit of a learning curve for faculty, particularly when it comes to creating rosters with clicker technology. The nice thing about Kahoot is it's free for students. The basic package, which I use, is also free for faculty. Um, if you intend to use Kahoot as a quizzing tool for points or bonus points, you just need to instruct the students to use their first name and last initial or a name that you'll recognize so that you can award them points or score accordingly. Except for figuring out how to download the Excel spreadsheet, it's extremely intuitive to use. And if you want a hint, for downing, downloading this spreadsheet, just look for the ellipsis, the dot, dot, dot. Once you find that on your screen, you just click download and 
you're good to go. Um, you might discover, like we did, that your learning management system has the functionality to share screen, to share your, your screen, and to upload and share files. This is obviously ne necessary to teach online. You might also discover that your LMS has, the, has a polling feature so that you can poll students during any presentation. Built-in clicker technology. I love it, and I use it all the time. Some websites that you might find helpful are included on this slide. RegisteredNurseRN.com contains how-to videos on nursing skills, NCLEX and HESI information, nursing school tips, care plans, job information, you name it. Nursing.com is a similar site. It contains 10-minute lessons, visual study tools, cheat sheets, NCLEX practice questions, and so on. Khan Academy is not a nursing site, but I'm sure many of you heard of it. It's a site it, that contains interactive software, videos, and articles about many topics. Students can search for extra help with certain topics, such as arterial blood gas analysis, just by typing that topic in the search bar. We have a few more resources, resources that were shared with us by the Mass Rhode Island League for Nursing. The first resource links you to a nursing simulation scenario library from, from Montgomery College in Montgomery County, Maryland. This is a resource for nursing educators in all settings. It's made possible by the generosity of the Healthcare Initiative Foundation, and the library is continuously being expanded, and it's funded by the Maryland Health Services Cost Review Commission. Uh, the second link does not contain any resources, but it helps you search for specific simulation scenarios or activities. The Online Nursing Education Best Practices Guide, which I will share with you on the next slide, is a guide for using evidence-based tools and strategies in the course development process. The purpose of the guide is to optimize the online learning experience. The One Guide, as it is called, is accompanied by a checklist that will facilitate adherence to one guide strategies. This guide and checklist were shared with me by a colleague that recently attended a Nurse Tim workshop, one of those nuts and bolts conferences. Um, it was entitled Best Practices for the Online Educator. For those of you who are not familiar with Nurse Tim workshops, go to nursetim.com to meet Dr. Tim Bristol. He has a wonderful assortment of webinars and conferences designed to help nurse educators meet their goals for growth and professional development and success. All right, moving on. Here's the one guide. As you can see by this graphic, there's three domains of evidence-based strategies for effective online teaching. The three equally important domains are course presentation, instructor presence, and assessment and measurement. The presenter, Renee Othmont from Texas A&M University, gave permission to share her documents. The next slide, you'll see the instructor checklist. The next slide. Yep, yeah, there it is. So um, this, you can use this to facilitate compliance with the one guide strategies on the previous slide. Again, this is being shared with you with permission from Dr. Renee Othamont from Texas A&M. I've tried to incorporate many of these best practices into my own online dosage calculations course. In the interest of time, I won't share with you my online course. However, if you're interested in meeting with me to review my online course, shoot me an email. I'd be happy to meet with you and share my course with you. That concludes our webinar today. I want to give a very warm thank you to Susan Sinkowitz and Mary Kitzmiller for putting together a really robust, comprehensive presentation, for sharing their experience, and for really going out of their way to outline all of these resources in detail. We have a lot of folks commenting that you both were fantastic, that this was a great webinar, and I want to echo that sentiment as well. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Mary. We really appreciate yeah, all welcome. the prep work, your time here today. And for those attendees still with us um, on the line, we will be uh, sharing all of these resources, a copy of the PowerPoint, as well as those presentation links. And I know that there were several of you who noted that you wanted that um, those steps outlined that Susan mentioned path. earlier. Yes, the I will send path. you the click path, Jan. Yep, I'll do that right now. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks again. And thank you so much. Great, great rest of the week. Take care.
Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.